Well, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm the rector of the University of Pisa and uh, uh, it's with great pleasure that our university hosts the 18th annual conference of the European Association for the Study of Religions. Uh, well, returning to Italy, 12 years after the Messina edition back in 2009, uh, our Department of uh, Civiltà and Forme del Sapere, Civilization and Forms of Knowledge, had the honor and pleasure of contributing, helping to put together an extremely high profile program on an essential topic, such as the link between resilience and the spiritual and religious dimensions, which is even more relevant in the particular historical moment that we are experiencing. Well, let me take this off. <laughs> A relevance witnessed, moreover, by the vastity of topics that will be treated in the next days, uh, ranging from theoretical aspects to actual cases, from antiquity to the present day, focusing in particular on the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as touching on different religious transitions different approaches and methodologies, never neglecting the most recent instances of the academic studies of religious. The University of Pisa is particularly attentive to the topic of this conference, since it was also included in the headings of the Project of Excellence, uh, our Department of uh, Civilization and Foremost Knowledge gained, uh, which is called the Times of Structures, Resilience, Accelerations, and Perceptions of Change in the Euro-Mediterranean area. This project has among uh, its key scientific areas the history of the regions, of the regions which Professor Chiara Ombretti Tomasi teaches at our university. Uh, moreover, as you know, she is the EASR Deputy General Secretary, and I take this opportunity to great and thank her for the great work she's doing. <laughs> Grazie, Chiara. Grazie. This is also the reason why the fact that your association selected PISA and our university at this conference venue represents a great pride for our community. And uh, I wish to sincerely thank you. At the same time, I would like to thank for being here with us, some remotely, some uh, in presence, uh, the president of the EASR, Professor Kip Knott, the president of the International Association for the History of Religions, Professor Tin Jensen, and the president of the Italian Society of the History of Religions, Professor Giulia Stefemi Gasparro. Many thanks also to the panelists that will attend in presence or uh, remotely the following five days of intense work. This conference, furthermore, marks the 20 year uh, since the birth of the European Association for the Study of Religions and the 70 year since the foundation of the Italian Society for the History of Religions. Two significant milestones reminding me of how our university contributed to the education of a scholar that to some extent can be, can be considered as one of the Italian pioneers in, the scientific, in this scientific field, Carlo Puini. In 1882, he published the very first introductory manual entitled Essays on the History of Religions. The first chair of History of Religions was appointed in Italy only 40 years later at the University of Rome. This is one more reason why it was particularly significant to curate the organization of this conference and host you for these days of work. Well, before giving the floor for the other welcome uh, um, messages, 
please let me thank my colleagues, the students, the PhD students, and the staff of the Department of Civilization and Forms of Knowledge. They, their contribution to the realization of this 18th conference has been essential for tuning up a particularly sensitive edition for the first time held in a hybrid mode. If we are here today, it is because the organizational machine has perfectly worked. That certainly represented a good test of resilience. So thank you for your kind attention and good luck for your work. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, I hope you can all see me. I've now lost you, so um, I'm assuming it's all working at your end. Um, Thank you very much to uh, greet you all and to thank our hosts um, in the city and at the University of Pisa. Uh, thank you very much to the warm welcome from the Rector. Uh, on behalf of our Executive Committee of the European Association, we'd like to thank you for your hospitality and your willingness to support this conference. As the Rector has already said, this is the 18th um, annual conference of the European Association for the Study of Religions. And we began over 20 years ago with the objective of bringing together scholars from across Europe and of promoting their international collaboration um, through the study of religions. Um, in this endeavour, uh, as I'm sure you know, we are we're affiliated to the International Association, and Tim Jensen will will welcome you on behalf of that association in a moment. The EASR, though, represents. Uh, national associations from across Europe. So we have 24 national members um, from uh, the East, from Ukraine, from Finland, from the Scandinavian countries down to the South and across to the far West of Europe. It's a pleasure, of course, for us re to return to Italy after this period of 12 years absence. As the Rector said, we were in Messina in 2009, and uh, I remember that conference with uh, Professor Gasparo very well. But it's gratifying now to be meeting in this august and ancient institution here in Pisa. I'm very sorry that I am not there in person. Um, in particular, we would like to extend our wholehearted thanks to Chiara Tomasi, our Deputy General Secretary and Associate Professor of the History of Religions here at the University. Her unstinting efforts to organize this very complex conference during such a difficult period um, have led to us being here today. For more than a year, she and her team, and, and this includes uh, her technical support, as well as the conference um, organisers, uh, have worked patiently and diligently to bring this project to fruition. It's a remarkable feat, um, not least of all as PISA has attracted the largest number of delegates of any conference since the EASR first began. I think it's around 900 delegates, maybe some 600 of us online. This achievement is, is a really positive outcome from what has otherwise been a very challenging period for international academic meetings. Opportunities for uh, academic exchange and travel have inevitably been curtailed by the COVID pandemic and the restrictions arising from it. 
that are still affecting us even now. Of course, those same problems and difficulties have also opened up new questions and issues for research on, on religions. And, and we will hear a little bit about that in this conference, but I suspect that, that in the years to come, there will be many more papers discussing this period. Scholars of religion from all over Europe and beyond now welcome the chance to present and discuss their work after this period of absence. Those who've been able to travel to Pisa will have the pleasure of seeing the city's attractions whilst also meeting new and old friends. Those of us participating online, though we are denied these benefits, nevertheless welcome the opportunity to give our papers and enjoy the discussion. Resilience is a great theme for the period we are now in. Um, I think uh, we have all had to show a degree of resilience. The Italian organizers have uh, certainly shown that in all the organization uh, that they have undertaken. Um, we thank you all for attending whether online or in person. And as president of the European Association, I wish you very well and extend a warm welcome to our General Assembly, which will be held on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon. You're all invited, should you wish to come. But until then, please enjoy the proceedings. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, okay. okay. Honorable Rector, Honorable President of the EASR, Chiara Tsumasi, Honorable President of the CESA, and Honorable Participants, Members of the EASR and the IHR. What a delight it is to see you again, in person. If not all of you, then at least more than none. And thanks, many thanks, and I'm afraid there will be some redundancy. It can be boring, but it's good for a lot of things, rituals, for instance, like this. Thanks again many times to our host, Professor Chiara Tomasi and her staff, and the University of Pisa. It is not least due to your hard work and determination, not to say release, resilience, that this 2021 EASR and IHR conference has materialized as an in-person and not just online conference. Thank you. Moreover, on top of that, you and the University of Pisa managed to provide online participation for those who could not or would not make it to Pisa in person. The CISA, the Societa Italiana di Storia delle Religioni, and the local Pisa host thus has arranged, in fact, the first but probably not the last, both and or hybrid EASR and IHR conference. It is a great achievement. For me as the IHR president and for me personally, being back again in person in Italy at a conference also hosted by the CISA, founded in 1951, one year after the founding of the IHR, is a special pleasure. The CISA founder and first president, Peter Zoni, following the passing away of Van der Leuve, served as the president of the IHR to his passing away in 1959. Peter Zoni and the CISA and a long line of illustrious Italian scholars have been key to the well-being and development of the IHR. Peter Zoni, as related, for instance, by Professor Casadillo, in the Newman 60s anniversary special issue in, from 2016 or 17, I can't remember, on the Newman and the IHR did not just host the IHR 1955 World Congress in Rome, where, by the way, the IHR got its present name. He was also the key player in regard to the establishment of Newman, then as today, the IHR flagship journal, and from the very beginning and up to now, the Italian society, also in its constitution, explicitly has been in support of the IHR academic and scientific profile. 
this is much appreciated. In 1969, Italian scholars and CISA once again hosted an IHR conference, this time the famous special one on the origins of Gnosticism, with its linked publication edited by Ugo Bianco. Ugo Bianchi. Ugo Bianchi, yet another famous and IHR dedicated scholar, served as IHR president from 1990 to 1995, and in 1990, ungefähr this time of the year, hosted the IHR World Congress 1990 in Rome. A congress memorable as witnessed by the proceedings for the discussions and interventions on the now as then highly, very, very important theme, the notion of religion in comparative research. It was also memorable, I think, for the fact that it served as a platform for some of the first, but certainly not the last, discussions about the possibility of changing the name of the IHR. Moreover, I find this important when we discuss the pros and cons of in-person and online meetings. To mention this, that is also mentioned by Don Wiebe in his article in the aforementioned Newman Anniversary Volume. Namely, there was a famous reception on the Capitoline Hills in the Major's Garden hosted by Bianchi. And I think that this is important because already yesterday evening I experienced what it means to be in person with colleagues. I met colleagues I would never have met if we were only online. I met persons who introduced me to the study of religions they were doing. I would never have been introduced to that if we were not in person. So I am aware that we may have other hybrid conferences, but personally I'm very much in favor of in-person conferences and congresses. Rome 1990 was not the end to Caesar and Italian scholars serving the IHR. And I kindly refer you to the reports in the IHR bulletin number 35 from 1998. And the 2002 publication edited by Professor Casadio, Ugo Bianchi, Una Vita per la Storia della Religione for an IHR co-sponsored colloquium in Florence in 1996 and for a Salerno 1997 IHR and CISA conference in memory of Bianchi. Unfortunately, I was not in Rome in 1955, nor in 90, nor in Messina in 1966, nor in Salerno or Florence later on. My first meetings with the CISA and the Italian colleagues however, were linked to the establishment and development of the EASR. And also in this regard, it must be said loud and clearly, the Italian scholars and the Italian society have played key and highly important roles. I'm sorry to bother you with all of this, but this is part of my job as a president. That is to greet people and thank them for all the work they have done for the IHR. Opportunities are rare and I take them when they come. The EASR, as you may hopefully all know, was established in Krakow in May 2000 in the context of a special IHR conference with a theme, Contemporary European Approaches to the Study of Religions. Professor Julia Svameni Gasparo, the first president of the EASR, who also served on the preparatory committee, presided over the first meeting of the elected committee and Professor Gasparo Moreau hosted the next meeting of the first committee in Messina in March 2001 during a symposium and in 2002 a publication with the title Themes and Problems in the History of Religions in Contemporary Europe. The first, I think, EASR-related publication. Giovanni Casadio can correct me if I'm wrong. The Messina meeting served as preparatory to the first regular EASR annual hosted by the British Association and Kim Knott in September 2001 in Cambridge. I think, Kim, that you remember that this conference was spectacular for many reasons, not least because of 9-11. And the fact, and this is a curiosum, that none of us ever talked about 9-11 when we were on stage. It was not mentioned during any of the days of that conference. Kind of interesting to think back. Now, Gaspar was re-elected president in Cambridge, and Professor Katsadio, I think, was elected publications officer. And then again, as it has already been mentioned, Professor Gasparo hosted in Messina 2009 another EASR and IHR conference 
with another theme in line with Krakow 2000 and Messina 2001, namely religion in the history of European culture. And also in line with the style of Professor Gasparo, the conference once again resulted in a series of important publications. This is not always the case, but it has been the case with the Italian conferences. One of which was a special issue of Historia Religionum, number two, 2010, published in Rome and in Pisa. So the Italian association and Italian scholars certainly have been actively engaged in the well-being of the EASR from the very beginnings. Now today, in this week in Pisa, here we are again, back with the Italian association, and yet this time with another local host, Professor Chiara Tomasi. I am, as I've already said, deeply impressed and deeply grateful to you, Professor Tomasi, and to your staff. This conference on resilient religion is an indication of the resilience of international and European scholarship on religion. But it is first and foremost a proof of the resilience and hard work of you, University of Pisa, as I've already mentioned. Now, extending greetings from the IHR leadership to all participants, I wish you all some very fine days here in Pisa or online. Allow me to end my talk on a personal note before I hand over to Professor Gaspar. Julia, if you are there now, it was an honor and a pleasure serving the EASR as General Secretary from 2000 to 2004. But it was an even greater honor and pleasure to serve with you as president. It has been a true pleasure, Julia, to stay in contact with you ever since. I wish you all the best and I hope to meet you in the not too distant future. Thank you. Posso cominciare? Cari colleghi, sono veramente felice di darvi il benvenuto all'inaugurazione di questa conferenza nell'Università di Pisa. Io sono molto grata a voi per aver risposto con tale generosità e impegno all'invito per conto della Società Italiana di Storia delle Religioni a riflettere sulle dinamiche della resilienza nel campo degli studi religiosi. In questo anno in cui si celebra il settimo centenario della morte di Dante Alighieri, che con la sua commedia divina ha segnato una tappa fondamentale nella costituzione della cultura europea, mi sia permesso rivolgere a voi qualche parola nella lingua del bel paese dove il si suona di cui in questi giorni siete ospiti in presenza reale o ideale e che certo tutti comprenderete. Quando la collega professoressa Chiara Tommasi ha proposto al comitato direttivo della Società Italiana di Storia delle Religioni quale oggetto dell'annuale convegno della Società Europea che le era stato affidato di organizzare il tema oggi molto attuale della resilienza in relazione al campo specifico dei nostri studi non era immaginabile come esso assai presto e con drammatica urgenza avrebbe coinvolto l'intera comunità umana a livello esistenziale in tutti i suoi aspetti. Ancora più, più importanti, dunque, appaiono oggi i risultati del presente incontro nella misura in cui essi porteranno un contributo significativo 
a definire e illustrare il ruolo e l'incidenza del tema nel quadro complesso dei fenomeni che definiamo come religiosi nell'esperienza culturale, storica ed esistenziale umana. Con l'augurio più cordiale di buon lavoro, dunque, rinnovo a voi tutti, a nome della Società Italiana di Storia delle Religioni, il benvenuto in questa università e nella città di Pisa. Grazie. So, before the conference gets into full swing and without taking too much time away from it, it is perhaps up to me, who oversaw the academic organization of this conference, to say a few words. Words of thanks, first of all, to the University of Pisa and the Department of Civilization and Forms of Knowledge, which have actively contributed with financial support to the organization of the event. And above all, to the many friends, not mere colleagues, friends of the department who have always given me their full support in this task and supported me with their help and advice. To the youngest students and colleagues and to all staff members who will support me in these days with their practical help. To all the other people near and far, to whom I have often turned, turned for a suggestion, to the Italian Society for the History of Religions, the European Society and the International Association under whose edges the conference takes place, the rector of the seminary, Monsignor Francesco Bacchi and Don Moreno Volpi, who provided the premises where the meeting will take place, to those who are here today, including organizers and participants, for believing in the possibility of returning to a live meeting without forgetting how many by connecting remotely and reach an extremely varied program. And here I risk to repeat what it has already been said, but in fact, when at the end of the conference in Bern, I was entrusted with the task of organizing the Congress in Pisa for 2021, I was already fully aware of the difficulties I would be encountering in the commitment required, although at that time nothing would have suggested the difficult circumstances in which we would have found ourselves operating and what a metamorphosis in body and soul would have been forced on us by the pandemic. The term resilience, now widespread, which we chose as the title for this edition, was then purely instrumental, linked to the excellent project of our department, but like a presentiment and in almost prophetic way, it proved to be in step with the times, and it is the true leitmotiv of this 2021 edition, as can be seen from the titles of the almost 800 papers presented with participants from all over the world, from the Antipodes to Latin America, passing through Asia and Africa, as well as from all European nations. If, however, there have been or will be shortcomings in the organization, last but not least today that the Oxford application program did not function, <laughs> I hope there can be put down to the exceptional nature of the situation, the uncertainty of the times, which has put everyone to the test, forcing us to change things often during the preparation, not being able to plan as we would have liked to, demonstrating, in fact, how resilience is not a mere abstract concept, but has its concrete application in everyday, in everyday life. At the time of the call for papers at the beginning of last autumn, a colleague hoped that the conference 
would be so successful as to fill a stadium. The disheartened skepticism with which I welcomed this wish in those months, marked by the dramatic circumstances of the second wave of COVID, today, in front of such large audience, changes into a grateful memory and also into a hope of optimism for future that can leave the difficulties behind us and that, in the year of Dante, may let us be rifatti sì come piante novelle, rinnovellate di novella fronde, puri e disposti a salir le stelle. Grazie. So good evening, everybody. I'm Massimo Introvigni, and I'm very thankful to University of Pisa, uh, EASR, and IAHR for this invitation to introduce this first session. One of the reasons I'm here is that I'm now myself a resident of the province of Pisa, if only from a few months, and uh, in touring Tuscany, I see a lot of uh, resilient uh, religion from the Tibetan Buddhists in Pomaya, five minutes from my home, to the Hare Krishna near Florence, to what is left of the tragedy of David Lazzaretti in uh, Arcidosso, to the civil religions of republicanism and anarchism. But we are here today because there is not only resilient religion, there is also resilient study of religion, and nobody is more resilient than Eileen Barker. Let me give you a few examples. First, she is physically resilient. Last time I saw her, it was in Italy, in a Chesnur conference in Torino, but before this, uh, here and somebody else who is here, we saw her in two subsequent conferences uh, in Kyrgyzstan and in Australia. And these two conferences were very close to each other, so I was very concerned of the long trips. Uh, and so I decided to go to Kyrgyzstan, rest there, and then go to Australia. But not Eileen Barker. She had some business in London. So she went to Kyrgyzstan, went back to London, went to Australia, went back to London. And she appeared perfectly fit and perfectly in good shape. She's also uh, culturally and sociologically resilient. She invented our discipline, the study of or the academic study of new religious movements, and she invented the word new religious movements. Well, Needleman say new religions, but it was not exactly the same. And she decided to stick with this word, even when people were not happy. I remember in one of our conferences, uh, she explained that new religious movements are either not new or not religious or not movements. <laughs> but still, uh, it's uh, better than cults or sects or whatever you. And I remember discussing with a new religious movement. Uh, they say, we are an old tradition. Uh, let's take out the words new religious movement from the article. They say, OK. I can replace them saying you are a destructive cult. And so uh, at this stage, they kept new religious movement and they realized the 
terminological innovation of Eileen Barker, how important it was. She has been resilient in not being co-opted by new religious movements. New religious movements, uh, sometimes they are nice guys, but they are always a little bit pushy. If you don't offend them, they are so accustomed to be offended that if you do not offend them, they believe you are part of them. And so uh, part of what we learned from Eileen was the resilience in not being swallowed or co-opted by the new religious movements we study. And we also learned the resilience in not being disturbed or distracted or stopped in the academic study of new religious movements by opponents who will say, if you don't attack or criticize the new religious movements, you are one of them. And that, uh, Eileen has been called many things, the mother of cult apologists, so we are her, uh, sons and daughters, which sounds very good. And that reminds me of uh, an economist, Eileen also met, uh, she went to the London School of Economics once, he wrote a couple of articles about Scientologists. They were not against, so he was called the Scientologist. And uh, when he complained, they say, don't worry, I wrote a thick book about Satanism and called the Satanist. <laughs> but they say, but why exactly my wife, who writes very sympathetic books about dog, is not called a dog? There is something wrong there. But I believe, yeah, Eileen has been extremely resilient, and uh, she has been resilient in building bridges between the critics and uh, scholars with a less uh, hostile or more sympathetic gaze as new religious movements. And it's because she has been so resilient that uh, we scholars of new religious movements, we are all here, and we have built uh, a growing, uh, successful, and I would say more importantly, fun branch of the study of religion in the 20th and 21st century. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our resilient scholar, Eileen Barker. Thank you, Massimo. I'll deal with you later. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I, I hate to admit it, but it's actually over half a century since I was last in Pisa. And that's why I jumped at the idea of coming when Chiara asked me. I had no idea how I'd manage it and if I'd known how awful it was because of COVID and having to get all sorts of tests and the tests didn't work and I had to isolate poor me in Pisa or rather just outside with Massimo and his wife for five days before being allowed free in your city. Um, it was all worth it and I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as Massimo said, the main focus of my research since the early 70s has been new religious movements or NRMs. And perhaps even more importantly, I have been interested in the social reactions to which they give rise. Well, what is an NRM? The reason some of us started using the term, as Massimo said, was because we didn't like the idea of the cults or the sects, which were no longer, uh -uh, how do I use this? Ah, being used in the way that sociologists of religion had used them as a subset of religions, as opposed to church and denomination. Uh, religion was, in a variety of ways, in the media and in the anti-cultist and a whole lot of general public, a bad thing. A cult is a dangerous pseudo-religion with satanic overtones which brainwashes and exploits its members, is involved in financial skullduggery and political intrigue, indulges in unnatural sexual practices, abuses its children and women, 
and carries out numerous criminal activities and is likely to commit mass suicide. You agree, right? <laughs> so you do need some resistance if you're going to survive that sort of reputation. Well, my colleagues and I wanted to start with a non-evaluative concept. And there were a whole lot of general ideas, but no specific idea that was put forward. Some thought it was religions from the East, which may have been around there for centuries or even millennia, and are now arrived more visibly in the West. Uh, these would be movements like the Hare Krishna, um, there we go. Um, and then others thought that it was a religion that was in tension with society. Um, this is often characteristic of the movements, but not, I've argued, a particularly useful definitional characteristic. Um, there are too many religions that we don't call new religions that have been in tension, and tension is very difficult to operationalize. When I started my research in the 1970s, oh, those are some tension places. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at seeing these at the same time. Um, first of all, I thought that post Second World War covered what we were studying, and that seemed to me a sensible idea. But then we found that it was including a whole lot of 19th century sects, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the um, Mormons, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and um, Seventh-day Adventists. And even more worrying methodologically was the fact that the new religions of the 50s and 60s, Scientology, the Unification Church, ISKCON, the Hare Krishna, um, Rajneesh, and the New Age and the Human Potential Movement, these were no longer all that new. And moreover, there were a whole lot of new, new religions that kept popping up. And then there were new, new, new religions. And the Japanese use that term. Sometimes get, when I, I, I ask for my paper to be edited, they cross out the news because they think that I must be making a mistake. These all bear some sort of family resemblance, but nonetheless, they were distinguishable from the ones that I'd been studying and fascinated by in the 70s, and still am. Then I decided that when actually doing research, as opposed to just talking, the most useful definition, methodologically speaking, was that new religious movement would be a first-generation religion. Now, this is comparatively easy to operationalize, far more than tension, high control religions, and certainly an improvement on bad religions or religions we don't like. There are difficulties. For example, the Mormons have more converts than they have people who've been born into. But generally speaking, this seemed to me to be most helpful. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be talking about, generally speaking. What about resilience? Almost by definition, old religions, just because they've survived into being old, have been resilient. It certainly isn't that they haven't changed. They obviously have, but they've changed in a way that's enabled them to carry on with something, beliefs, practices, that made them feel and be recognized by others as survivors with continuity. So I'd like to suggest two hypotheses. First, at any particular time, new religious movements are more likely to be in a position where their resilience is being tested than older religious movements. And secondly, the older a religion is, the more likely it is that any resilience it has to demonstrate will be to deal with external forces, whereas the newer a religion is, the more likely it is to have to be resilient to both external and internal forces of change. It almost follows from the first hypothesis that the younger a religion is, the more likely it is that it will not be resilient to the swings and arrows of outrageous fortune and just die, ceasing to survive the internal and external forces it finds it's been confronting. 
Rodney Stark once said that the majority of new religions didn't survive their first hundred years, and I feel I find no reason to disbelieve him. But we can ask, oh, my title of the talk, just to remind you, is why can't we stay the same? The same as what? What is it about new religious movements that they want to keep? Now here we have a problem, because the only generalization that one can make about new religions, apart from the fact that they've been referred to as a new religion or cultural sect, is that one cannot re re generalize about them. They differ according to anything you can think of, their rituals, practices, financial arrangements, leadership style, all sorts of different things. When I was teaching, I used to say to my students, anyone who can come up with one characteristic that all new religions share, I will give them a big box of chocolates. And that big box of chocolates is still sitting on my shelf. Having said that, however, being a sociologist, I am now going to generalize. Um, so I'm going to suggest how new religions will have to exhibit a certain amount of resilience to survive one way or another. They will have to undergo changes. Even those that are determined to stay the same have paradoxically to change in order to remain the same. So the first characteristic is by definition that they're first generation, and this means that they're converts. And as anyone who has been a convert or knows one is likely to be aware, converts tend to be far more enthusiastic, even fanatic, about their religion than those who have been born into and brought up in a religion. But while in some ways the enthusiasm of their new beliefs makes them strong, it also makes them vulnerable. They will not have fully understood and incorporated the new worldview and are likely to have several taken for granted assumptions about reality and how one should behave that don't necessarily fit with the new worldview. Most of the better known new religions have had to face the challenge of a high turnover rate among new converts who find the movement isn't after all as much to their liking as they had thought at the, at the beginning. Despite accusations of brainwashing and coercive practices, new religions are not nearly as effective in their techniques as they might like to be. The revolving door of membership remains throughout the lives of all religions, but other things being equal, it revolves at a far slower rate the longer the convert has been in a religion. And the longer one has been a member, the more resilient one becomes to the initial strangeness of one's religion. One bonds with fellow members, and the longer one has been separated from previous friends, and in some cases cut off for one's relatives, the more one is likely to become dependent on the movement, not only for spiritual succor, but perhaps also for material and secular needs. And although people do leave old religions, members born into them are more likely to accept their religion's worldview as an unquestioned fact of life. A second characteristic is that they tend to attract an atypical representation of the population. In the past, new religions have frequently appealed to the socially, economically, or politically oppressed, promising them a better life, if not in the here and now, then in the life hereafter. Many of the new religions that became visible in the West following World War II, however, appealed disproportionately to young white adults from the middle classes. And the promise was more likely to be of some sort of spiritual, relational, career-orientated achievement in this life, instant enlightenment, a closer relationship to God or to one's fellow human beings, or a feeling of worth, having a purpose in life. Now, this is quite a tall order. The promise of heaven or a paradise hereafter can be much more difficult to refute. 
But whatever the promise, a membership that is limited by age or class or experience or skills is likely to be lacking or at least weak for accessing some sort of resources that are useful for resilience. A movement with enthusiastic young converts and no responsibilities for either old or young dependents has its advantages. But the young also lack experience and those in positions of leadership may be ineffectual on the one hand or overbearing and insensitive on the other. Religions that appeal pre predominantly to the elderly, the poor or the oppressed may lack the vitality and the physical strength of youth and so on. Older religions which have a more balanced population could be more resilient in the face of their specialist requirements. A third characteristic, oh, that's the youthful children of God. A third characteristic is that the new religions often have a charismatic founder and leader. And these are usually thought by their followers to have some sort of special powers. Such leaders are unbound by rules or tradition and can change their mind at a moment's notice, meaning that they are both unpredictable and unaccountable to anyone except perhaps to God if they themselves don't happen to be God. This can be a source of strength. The successfully charismatic leader can have a hold over his or her followers that is stronger than that of any ordinary leader who is bound by rules and tradition. On the other hand, followers can become disillusioned if the leader goes over the top and loses his magic power. Roy Wallace described the fragility of David Berg, the founder of the Children of God, and towards the end of his life, his successors actually signed a declaration denouncing much of his teachings. More often, it is the death of the charismatic leader that presents the new religion with some of the greatest potential problems. When Prabhupada, the founder in the West of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness died, of the 11 successor gurus he appointed, more than half had been found guilty of some grave misdemeanor within a short time. These included gun running, drug distribution, conspiracy to murder, financial fraud, and sexual misconduct. Nonetheless, ISKCON did summon up enough resilience to survive. I'll return a bit to this later. But my point is, new religions have a problem on their hands. Only rarely is a charismatic leader replaced by another charismatic leader, though it does happen sometimes, as when the charismatic Elizabeth Clare Prophet took over from over the church universal and triumphant when her husband Mark died. Usually a bureaucratic structure is brought into place, which may have existed to some extent under the original leader, but now it is the rules or tradition that the authority structure depends on. And if these are resilient enough, the movement might continue. Though it's likely that it will lose at least some of its following. One possibility is that the movement will no longer manage to hold itself together under a single leader. And this happened in the case of the Unification Church, popularly known as the Moonies, after the Reverend Moon died. Mrs. Moon, who we see here at the um, remembrance of um, Moon, has managed to claim the largest following, but has lost several members to two of her sons. So what you once had as the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity started to thin off when the eldest living son created the Global Peace Foundation. And then when Moon died, Mrs. Moon got the um, Family Federation for the World, something of unification, I've forgotten what. Um, what? What? Peace. 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 Thank you. Peace. Yep. Then the youngest son started the Sanctuary Church. That's the church that um, has the guns. 
and they take their guns to their weddings and things. Um, then there are several other schisms, a couple in um, Japan, for example. And then there are some that just sort of felt disconnected and didn't know where they were going. There were some that sort of slipped to the margins of the movement, not knowing quite where they were. There were former members who left and just got on with their lives. And there were ex-members who left and started attacking the movement. So the original Unification Church had pretty well disappeared and doesn't exist, although there are enormous legal battles going on at the moment trying to sort out exactly what the Unification Church is. A fourth characteristic that's fairly common in new religions is that they tend to have a relatively dichotomous worldview. Temporarily, time is divided into before and after. Being a miserable sinner before I saw the light and became one of the world's elect. Or the world is full of sin and wickedness now, but after Armageddon, the kingdom of heaven on earth will be realized. If things seem bad now, they will get better. We just have to wait or perhaps carry out certain actions to bring about the millennium. Morally, there's a sharp distinction between good and bad and right and wrong. Theologically, happenings can be those of either God or Satan. This could give the movement a useful ploy if something goes against them, as it can be interpreted that it's because they're actually succeeding in their mission that God, that, sorry, that Satan has got worried. And so this is why they appear to be doing so, so well. And similarly, if an intransigent member is being disruptive, he or she can be accused of being in Satan's power. Perhaps the most pertinent of the binary mindsets in many religions is that between them and us, when a sharp boundary is drawn between the saved, the members who have seen and accepted the truth and the outside world which is seen as bad and wicked and damned, or at least certainly not one of us. Uh, sorry. Oh dear, can you stop this happening? <laughs> uh, seems to have run away. Dichotomous worldview. Okay. While strict boundaries, reinforced by such means as rules against communicating with outsiders except when necessary for recruitment or economic reasons, by special clothes or a special language which is incomprehensible to outsiders, all these things can create internal cohesion and protect new converts from polluting ideas and tempting alternatives but it can also engender suspicion and hostility from outsiders, some of whom, especially anti-cult circles, now something has gone wrong, um, oh well, um, react by generalizing about the new, ah, it's got a mind of its own, this thing. It's resilient to my wishes. Um, some of whom, especially in the anti-cult circles, react by generalizing about all the religions they have labeled as cults and see them as unambiguously bad. Having clear binary distinctions and rigid boundaries can in short foster a certain degree of resilience, but inflexible lines can be fragile and older religions who are more prepared to sway with the wind are arguably, arguably more resilient to forces for change than the new ones. And indeed, most new religions that survive do undergo a process of denominalization, becoming more accommodating to and accommodated by the wider society, but by no means all. Some, such as the Plymouth Brethren, who I've lost, no, appeared somewhere else. Oh well. Um, the Plymouth Brethren, they're better known as the Exclusive Brethren, keep some very strict, keep some very strict them us rules. When, as one of the few non-brethren to visit them in their homes, I am treated with politeness, 
and at me mealtime, I'm given a delicious meal with a glass of wine on a tray in a room by myself, while they eat in another room. They have, however, gone through some radical changes, radical for them, since I first met them, when, like some of the branches of the Amish or the Mennonites, they eschewed any kind of electronic devices, though they did have telephones. For their businesses, however, they needed a fax machine. So rather like Jews asking a goy to light the fire on the Sabbath, they would go to the next door business and ask them to send and receive their faxes. Gradually, however, it became increasingly vital for the resilience of their businesses that they should use computers. And I was amazed one day when one of their PR men gave me a card which had his email address. Then when I visited one of their schools, I found rows of computers in the hall. They now own a large and profitable business that makes and sells computers. That is truly an example of the kind of bending of the wind in the wind trans resilience that allows a new religion of the 19th century to survive. But I still eat alone. A fifth characteristic, let's see what happens now, um, has already been mentioned. And it is that they are frequently treated with hostility by the surrounding society. The early Christians were thrown to the lions, the, uh, but they have survived. The Cathars were burnt at the stake, but they did not survive. Falun Gong has been persistently persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party, with reports that there is strong evidence to support of having their organs removed for transplant. Yet they have been remarkably resilient, persisting in practicing, as indeed have other Chinese new religions, labeled Xia Zhao, or evil cult, or more accurately, heretical teachings by the Communist Party. There is, of course, the argument that being attacked can in itself revitalize the movement. It becomes increasingly united as at times of war, when overcoming the enemy makes petty in squabbles irrelevant. I remember visiting the Unification Church in Denmark some years ago and being told that things were really going rather bad. Curious, I asked why. I had thought things had calmed down over the past few years after the movement had been the subject of virulent attacks by an anti-cult group that had all but disappeared after the death of its charismatic leader. That's the trouble, my unificationist informer told me. Everything now is so boring. There was no longer the exciting stimulus of being a courageous, persecuted Muni. And of course, old religions can face antagonisms from society, including other religions, as in the Soviet Union or in a theocratic state but also between themselves as during the Crusades, um, the Reformation, and all too many modern societies, as for example in South Asia between the Muslims and Hindus, or Myanmar, where the Rohingya and other Muslims have been attacked by Buddhists. Nonetheless, it's possible, it's, po it's probably fair to say that it is possible, but not probable, that old religions will find themselves under attack, at least in countries where they've been established for several years. While it is not only possible, but probable that a new religion will experience some discrimination, if not outright persecution in many countries of the world, including the country of their origin. Their potential need for resilient responses to the hostility from outside exists for all religions but is, I'm suggesting, greater for the new religions. The sixth and final characteristic that I want to mention is again one that's already been intimated, and that is that they are liable to change far more radically and rapidly than older religions. As you may or may not remember, at the start of my talk, I put forward the hypothesis that not only did new religions need to show more resilience for their survival than older religions, 
but also that while some older religions were most likely to face challenges demanding resilience from external forces, new religions were more likely to face such challenges from both external and internal forces. Older religions do, of course, need to show resilience in the face of some internal changes. There are they are large enough to contain considerable diversity within their fold, which, as I've already said, could be an advantage, but they fi may find themselves having to contain a variety. Sometimes, as in the Roman Catholic Church, they've created special orders, such as Opus Dei, or the Legionnaires of Christ, or Focolare. And these can appeal to and fulfill some of the more idiosyncratic, spiritual, and other needs of some of the members. Sometimes, however, the borders orders have strayed too far from the Vatican, and although they might still call themselves Catholic, these operate without its blessings and come under the category of new religious movements, examples being the Army of Mary and the Apostles of Infinite Love. There's Opus Dei. The Apostles, that's Pope Gregory the 17th. He's died since, but um, that was another new religion which came out of the Catholic Church. The Vatican has always had also had internal problems with scandals concerning its finances, its attitude towards women, and some of its schools, and the Magdalene laundries for fallen women. And perhaps most severely of all, the existence of pedophilic, pedo, pedophilic priests. You know what I mean. I shall return to this at the end. But in spite of all this and a pretty severe knocking in some of these cases, the Catholic Church has remained remarkably resilient, having enormous resources so far as wealth, specialist lay people such as lawyers, and a spiritual heritage on which it can draw. I will leave others to judge where the Vatican too increased or decreased its ability to survive. Personally, I believe it was a sign of resilience but I am aware, aware that there are those who think differently and that it was, in fact, the beginning of the end. Slightly more wobbly have been the external challenges it has faced in places such as the Soviet society and present-day China. It has, however, proved resilient enough to emerge after the fall of the Berlin Wall in most of its former glory particularly perhaps in Poland, where it didn't really lose it that much, and Hungary, and Croatia, and some others. The Protestant churches have also faced internal problems. But as with the Catholics, most of this has been due to arguments over sex and gender, women priests, abortion, contraceptives, homosexuality, and so on. It could be argued that these were, at least in part, external problems brought about by changing attitudes in Western society as a whole. Eastern religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Jainism, Zoroastrianism, etc., have all faced challenges of modernity, but they too, in their different ways, have been pretty resilient. But what I want to discuss are some of the internal challenges that are to resilience that the new religions, and the very, very generally speaking, are no longer major problems for the older religions. As I've already stressed, you can't generalize about new religions, but I shall try to highlight some of the problems that they face, drawing on some specific examples. Perhaps the most seriously and universally applicable challenge for new religions is the demographic changes they will have to face. Members grow older. An extreme example of the difference that this can be can be demonstrated by looking at the children of God and comparing it in the 1970s and the 1980s. In the 1970s, I told you they were attracting enthusiastic young converts with an average age of 23, and as I mentioned, they had no children or elderly people as defendants. So they were free to travel around the world fundraising and taking Jesus into the heart for new converts. 
Now, as you may remember, the Children of God was, like the Rajneeshi movement, known as a sex cult in the 1980s. They not only believed in, but practiced free sex or sharing within their communities, they also practiced flirty fishing, a method of demonstrating Berg's interpretation of the law of love and how much Jesus loved them to men, or occasionally women, whom they met largely at nightclubs by engaging in sexual relations. The flirty fishing didn't last all that long. It was officially banned by the movement by the end of the 80s. But that was not before many of the so-called hookers for Jesus had become pregnant, some of them on multiple occasions. Birth control was frowned on, and it was not uncommon for women to have a dozen or more children. So although the average age of the membership was still 23, um, 20 years later, the demographic profile was almost entirely opposite to what it had been in the 70s. There were now dependents. Children were taking up valuable resources of both time and money. The enthusiastic recruits were now middle-aged and not so keen to go scooting around the world at a moment's notice. A similar pattern, if not so marked, could be found emerging with most of the other new religions that had been hitting the headlines. Krishna devotees, despite their official preference for celibacy, and the unificationists, despite having to postpone starting a family for several years after being blessed in marriage, they all managed to produce children who proved in different ways to present considerable problems to their respective movements. While it might be thought that on the plus side, the second generation would provide a steady increase in membership, that turned out to be a short-lived hope, as most of the first cohort of second-generation children in such families left the movement as soon as they could. This was largely because of the inappropriate treatment they received, and it was only after those new religions were resilient enough to realize what was happening and change their ways that they managed to keep at least some of the second and subsequent cohorts. But these were not the enthusiastic, single-minded young converts that their parents had been. By this time, well into the 21st century, the Children of God, now calling itself the Family International, um, the early converts were aging and the leadership had become aware that the financial sustainability of any kind of pensions for them was just unavailable. Being a millenarian group that was expecting the second coming of Jesus to arrive before the children were grown up, they had paid no heed for the morrow. They had seen no need to amass property or any kind of wealth. A similar problem of aging was being recognized by another new religion, originally known as the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, but now known as Triratna. But for them, the problem was brought about by a different group, Favoring celibacy, the members had few second generation members and the initial young enthusiasts had become less prone to proselytizing and getting new members as they matured and the initial enthusiasms diminished. What they saw was a membership that was not only growing old, but would soon be dying out altogether unless they did something about attracting new religions, new members, sorry. To some extent, they have instituted new approaches to the problem, but the movement and some others like it are still in a precarious position. And then, of course, there are several instances among the better known religions that aged themselves out of existence. The last Shaker died recently, and so has the last remaining member of the Panacea Society. ISKCON which now has a relatively few of the erstwhile members that it used to have of Western hippies. Um, they've mainly left the movement or just sort of become ordinary people living in nuclear families. But what they have done, their resilience, has been largely from attracting large congregations of families 
from South Asian backgrounds, eager to find temples that perform traditional Hindu rituals in both America and Europe and other Western countries. Another Indian new religion in the, in the West, the Swami Narayan movement. Um, I've lost the Swami Narayan movement. Oh, I've lost it. There's the Swami Narayan movement, sorry. Um, performs a similar function enabling it to be a resilient movement in the West, extraordinarily resilient. And of course, charismatic leaders tend to die, despite the fact that some of them claim they won't. Um, one example is this movement called Living Together or Together Forever. It has various different names. The three of them, and they discovered the secret of physical Im immortality. Unfortunately, however, one of them died fairly recently, so they've had to be resilient in yet another way. In some cases, it's possible that a new religion survived for at least some time after the founder's death just because he had died. And this was arguably partially the case with the children of God in the early 90s. Um, as I mentioned, the, the subsequent leadership denounced a lot of his teachings in a big court case that we had in Britain. But as I suggested earlier, the founder's death certainly provides a new religion with a challenge that's not faced by old religions, for which there is a clear path of succession, whether it be by the vote of the cardinals or the appointment of an Archbishop of Canterbury or the recognition of a Dalai Lama or by the decree of the Chinese Communist Party. Apart from demographic challenges, another internal challenge that can require at, some times, at times ingenious resiliency, if such a word exists, is the theology or general belief system of new religions. These will not have been adjusted with the passage of time, incorporating changes that work in the way that the older religions may have succeeded in doing. One of the more common and challenging beliefs is that the end time is near and that some catastrophic or at least fundamental radical change will occur. And as if, if this is expected on a particular date, the risk is high indeed. If you have declared that the world is going to end on May the 21st and you wake up on May the 22nd and nothing seems to have happened, some explaining is needed to be done. According to this gentleman, Harold Campion, a spiritual judgment had taken place on that date, and both the physical rapture and the end of the world would occur on the 21st of October, 2011. Later, it said he explained that it was God's mistake, not his. Pessinger and his others, in their book, When Prophecy Fails, tells how when the eagerly awaited spacecraft did not arrive, the members of the small group they were observing renewed their enthusiasms and proselytizing efforts. But this doesn't actually happen as much as one might expect, at least from Festinger's work. However, when expected craft didn't arrive to collect the members of Heaven's Gate, they decided to transition by taking their own lives and taking a ride on a spacecraft trailing comet hail boop bop There have, of course, been a few other new religions that have shown what they might call resilience, but might others be called by others a lack of resilience, when death was the solution to their problems. Among the best known, there's Jonestown, when over 900 members of the People's Temple were murdered or committed suicide in the Guyana jungle. Then there was the Solar Temple, where suicides and murders took place in Canada, Switzerland, and France. The death of the Branch Davidians in Waco was arguably more of the FBI's solution than that of David Corrish and his followers. Similarly, one could argue that although members of the Manson family are still alive, they're in prison, where Charles Manson recently died. So it would be highly questionable to say that the movement has survived. Though there could be instances where suicide bombers could be classified as a kind of resilience for a new religion 
and indeed 9-11. We'll mention it this time, Tim. Returning to millennial new religions, many have been surprisingly resilient in the face of apparent disconfirmation. One short-term response is that the prophesier has got his dates wrong, and this can work all right on perhaps a couple of occasions, but it can't be used indefinitely without loss of credibility. Safer it is to make the date unknowable but imminent if one wants to keep the urgency of an imminent happening. But even that can only last for a limited time. When first generations might expect the end within their lifetime, third generation members are less likely to live with the same expectation. First generation children of God, who at one time thought 1993 was the time, are now more likely to say, within their children's or perhaps their grandchildren's lifetime. The second generation in the children of God are more likely to shrug their shoulders if you ask them, or to make some comment about how they were frightened by the thought of the terrible things that were going to happen, or how they wished they had had a proper education for a future that they once thought they would never have. When I asked one of the early Korean unification missionaries who had been telling early converts in America that the kingdom of heaven would be restored on earth in 1968, what she thought when nothing obvious had happened, her reply was that she must have misunderstood father, as Moon was called by his followers. All references to 1968 had disappeared by the time I met the movement in 1974. There were, however, a series of seven-year foundation courses which were preparing for the kingdom of heaven. Many years later, I met up with a unificationist whom I had known as a loyal member in the early 70s and was surprised to learn that she had left the movement. She had, she said, been tired of waiting for yet another seven years and had decided after the completion of the latest foundation course when she learned that there was yet another final seven years ahead, that she wanted to have a life outside before she died, waiting. Another response is to say that the happening did happen, but it was at a spiritual level rather than a mundane level. Joanna Southcutt's baby Messiah, Shiloh, was born into the spirit world. The new age has morphed since the founding uh, since the, sorry, has morphed since the late 1960s from a belief in the arrival of an age of Aquarius or a harmonic convergence to a belief that we must all change ourselves as individuals. Sometimes it's said that a terrible happening was prevented because people didn't believe and follow God's instruction. Um, the basic theology of the unification church teaches that it was because Jesus wasn't accepted by his fellow Jews that he was murdered before he could get married and restore the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is why we had to wait for Moon to arrive as the Lord of the Second Advent. Or they might say that the new religion was saved from world disaster through its prayers or chanting or what have you. In the case of the Church Universal and Triumphant, some believe that it saved the world from a nuclear holocaust. The reason Enshi Rikyo released sarin gas in the Tokyo underground was, in the words of the title of Lifton's book, destroying the world to save it. Ashahara, having predicted the world would be destroyed by a nuclear war between the 30th of October and 29th of November, 2003. Hon Bing Chen, the leader of a new religion called Chen Tao, preached that a nuclear holocaust would destroy Europe and Asia in 1999. When nothing happened, he apologized and said he'd got it wrong. And in the face of this, it would appear that Chen Dao was not all that resilient. When some new religions, such as the Millerites in the, 19, in the 1880s, before their great disappointment, they sold and gave away a lot of their belongings. Some of the new religions I have studied have anticipated that something might not happen and made contingency plans. I was saying with staying with the 12 tribes, 
also known as the Messianic Community in 1999, when they were discussing what they would print in their web page and in their journal if nothing happened with the arrival of the millennium. But older religions, if they have a lineal rather than a cyclical worldview, will say that they are living with the promise, was that me? <laughs> that they are, something's happening. <laughs> Um, they're living with the promise of Jesus' second coming, but cannot know when it will happen. The lives of most of their members are not driven by the thought that the world as we know it has only a limited time left. They plan for a future. And my grandchildren believe that climate change will bring about the end if we don't do anything quickly. And as I speak, my grandson is demonstrating in what some might refer to as his new religion, Extinction Rebellion. However, the story about whether Gaia will be resilient enough to preserve this planet is not a subject I can explore with any confidence today. Turning to external pressures for change, there have been and doubtless will continue to be many that test the resilience of both old and new religions. Wars, political changes such as the creation of the Soviet Union, the Cultural Revolution in China, the Iranian Revolution of 1979, and no doubt the takeover of Af Afghanistan by the Taliban are all happenings that can affect both young and old religions. But as I mentioned later, earlier, the old are likely to have more resources and draw on, to draw on for protection. Sheer numbers can be a considerable asset in democratic countries where people vote. Contrarywise, lack of access to persons of status can be severely testing for the new religions, the more resilient of which will find lawyers, politicians, hierarchs in the established religions, or even academics to fight their cause. Sometimes an upheaval such as the fall of the Berlin Wall offers new religions a new opportunity with access to a large pool of con potential converts. However, the honeymoon of their newfound freedom was short-lived when the older religions, often with the cooperation of the state and Western anti-cult movements, started attacking them and their right to freely proselytize in several of the countries of the former Soviet Union. And under President Xi Jinping, new religions are finding themselves even more under attack than the older religions, and they're under attack too. One of the most important external tests of resilience has been the media, who, always anxious to get a good story, pounced on the cults with lurid stories about brainwashing their recruits, breaking up families, abusing women and children and threatening the very fabric of society. The growth of the so-called anti-cult movement and the practice of deprogramming from the 1970s, although in some ways disastrous for the people involved, did in some ways strengthen the righteous resolve of the movements, giving them permission to be more cut off than they might otherwise have been from the rest of society. Even more testing in some ways was the rise of the internet. One help for new religions was that they could spread their message far more widely than had previously been the case. Another advantage was that leaders could have direct communication with both members and potential members. On the other hand, members might become less easy to supervise as communications, both at a horizontal level within the lower echelons of the movement and across the boundaries of them and us, this became considerably easier, giving the individual members more resilience to the intransigencies of the leadership and the movement as a whole. At the same time, the anti-cult movement was able to broadcast warnings and horror stories, which might or might not be true. The advent of social media exaggerated the situation even further. One further consequence of the internet was the emergence of a whole new type of new, new religions, um, which not only operated carrying out rituals and propagating their belief on their websites, 
but were actually virtual religions with little or no outside existence outside the ether. I could elaborate at length, but my time is coming to an end. Um, I've just got a bit more. Um, so what I would like to do is briefly mention one last phenomenon that has tested the resilience of both old and new religions over the past 30 or so years, and that's the sexual abuse of children. Although it's always been frowned on for centuries, perhaps millennia, the religious have been taking advantage of their positions of trust to behave in a, what is euphemistically called an inappropriate manner with young children. This has only recently been publicly recognized as the shocking phenomenon that it is recognized to be today. First widespread scandals were the result of the exposures in the press about the extent to which the Roman Catholic Church had been harboring pedophile priests. When complaints had been made, the church authorities had done little more than reprimand the priest in question and or quietly remove him to another parish where he could carry on the abuse. The exposes that have ensued have not only shown the extent that this was the practice in the Catholic Church, but also in pretty well all of the other old religions throughout the world, each being more keen to preserve its reputation than to take care of the young victims of the abuse. And perhaps not surprisingly, it was discovered that some of the new religions were also guilty of not only having perpetrators in their midst, but of covering this up. The details differed widely between movements. With Hare Krishna, it was mainly young boys in the movements, gurukulas, boarding schools, who were abused, largely for structural reasons. With the children of God, it was almost entirely young girls who suffered for cultural reasons, with the law of love. And in the Jesus army, uh, evangelical uh, new religion in Europe. I don't know why that's got back to front. They don't have their buses like that. It's just something that's happened with the camera. With them, it was both boys and girls who were abused by pedophiles that the movement brought and took under its wing without any precautionary safety measures, measures being taken. Although the Catholic and mainstream churches have undergone searing criticisms, and their reputations have received severe blows, including financial compensation in the millions of dollars, it's still possible to say they have shown remarkable resilience. Changes have been introduced, and the rhetoric is that it was an unfortunate occurrence in the past that has now been remedied and will not be repeated. The new religions, however, have not been so resilient. All three of the movements I mentioned have been, were communal in their early days. None is now. ISKCON has managed to survive, but this was primarily, as I said, because it gathered around it the support of a large congregation of Asian descent and visits the temples and attends Hindu festivals, but otherwise lead their own independent and separate lives. The Children of God is now little more than a virtual community existing as a presence on the internet, but individual members are now attending mainstream Christian churches, if any, and tending to keep quiet about any involvement they have had with the movement. The Jesus Movement, Fellowship, Army, has ceased to exist in any sense. The financial repercussions of the abuse were too great for it to survive, and it dissolved itself. Of course, the stories are more complicated than I can indicate, but it is clear that the older religions have managed to be considerably more resilient in the face of such public trans scandals than the newer religions. So to conclude, new religions defined as those with a predominantly first generation membership have been remarkably resilient in the face of the challenges with which they are presented. However, such common characteristics as inexperienced converts, lack of economic and social capital, unpredictable and mortal charismatic founders, a rigid binary worldview, 
general suspicion, antagonism from the wider society, and the likelihood that it will face rapid and radical change due largely to the vagaries of its demographic composition and the claims of its relatively untried beliefs. All these, I have suggested, point to the probability of new religions being considerably less resilient than the older religions, who were, after all, themselves at one time among the more resilient of new religions. And now I look forward to finding out what everyone else has been finding out about resilient and resi religion and resilience. Grazie.